So I, f I feel really honoured to share this evening with you. Um, my concern is economic literacy. What do we know and understand about economics? <coughs> and so tonight I want to do two things really, to talk about economics. And for me that's about showing the connection between different issues. There may be things that you already know about like debt or inequality or you know, peak oil or whatever, but how do these things link up? That, that's the thing that I felt confused about and wanted some clarity around, so I wanted to share where I've got to on that. And then the second thing is to talk about talking about economics. So, you know, I really believe we can't leave economics to economists, especially since most of them are slightly insane at the minute, and I'll say why I think that. There's lots of fantastic ones around, but the in isolation, they need our support. So it's how can we talk about economics? Um, and that's where the street school economics idea comes from. And I think I've got a feeling you're going to be a pretty clued up audience, and there may be things in here I'm talking about that you know more about, but I think that's okay. You know, we can, um, we can figure out how to use this information, and in a way, it's kind of what I've put together is an offer, you know, that you, it, this presentation could be reused in other settings. So I guess I found myself, um, I'm a physical scientist in training. Um, I did molecular biophysics and a few years of research. So um, I'm, I, I've done lots of courses around economics, um, but that's, that's my background. And I found myself wondering what economics really was. You know, why are we sort of peddling on this manic treadmill and why can't we stop it? I really believe there's lots of people that want to stop you know, there's that sort of feeling of being on this, on this uh, manic treadmill and it's sort of, OK, let me understand more about economics. I was doing quite a, a bit around tax justice and do take these tax justice things if you want them. Um, and I started off getting Economics for Dummies. And what a stupid book that is. Don't bother with that book as far as I'm concerned. It, it talks about how economics helps you to get what you want. But, but I know that I buy things that I didn't want, you know, because I was busy and I felt guilty and all oh, the kids really like that off the telly and oh shit, you know, I've just bought this thing. Um, I didn't want it. And they also talk about economics being about scarce resources. You know, there's these scarce resources and how do we make sure that you get your share of the scarce resources. But what's scarce about money these days? You know, with quantitative easing where they're shoving a load of money, how is that scarce? It's like the opposite of scarce. There's trillions of quantitative easing. So it doesn't seem to me it's about scarce resources. And the first economics book I read that made any sense to me, I don't know if you've heard of it, hands up if you have, The Grip of Death. Um, the Grip of Death, well worth a read. Um, I, I would have brought it, but I've loaned it to somebody foolishly. But it, Grip of Death means mortgage, mortgage, <coughs> death grip. And that sort of explains what it feels like to be in a debt-based economy. And they talk about, well, they talk about this, actually. This, this madness that we're all on. And when you try to get out of the madness, um, it's quite hard to resist it. You know, it's very hard. You get a mortgage, you've got to keep peddling. Um, the consumerism, the pressure. And I thought, yeah, that's, that's how I experience the economy. It doesn't make sense to me. It doesn't feel as if it's there to support my life. It feels as if... It, um, in the words of a, a friend of mine, it's like being farmed if you want to take it in a, an extreme way. And I've actually got some stickers here that say that, you know, we're being farmed by the richer sites. That's kind of how it feels to me. It's kind of how can we extract money. And, and actually Mark Carney, who's our, the new governor of the Bank of England, talked about how we've got to increase our productivity. What the hell was he on about? You know, why do I have to be more productive? You know, in, in New Economics Foundation are actually saying we could have a three-day working week, but they want us producing more. What's that about? Co-ops produce more. Why can't we have more co-ops if that's what they want? Who are they anyway? So, you know, it's not exactly making us happy. We, we know we're running this madness around the climate and there's, we're all drowning in debt and the rich are getting richer so, so, so you know why are we here what's driving it and why do we seem unable to stop it they're the kind of questions that I really wanted to answer and of course it is about the economy I mean we could talk about the spirituality side of this as well you know why have we got here as a human uh, species and I, I, I really think that's a good conversation to have but it's not the one for tonight but certainly what's manifesting um, is, is, a, is a bad economy and um, people will say that economics is a social science that analyzes the production distribution and consumption of goods and services and that's partly what it's about at least 
But we can't leave economics to economists. We have to develop some empowerment around it. We need some economic literacy. Now, we, what we have is um, a form of economics. The, the economic system we have is neoliberal capitalism. It's a very specific uh, form of economy. And it's very useful to the neoliberals if you have got a bit of a sense of that, that some of the things in these buzzwords are true. So the, the sort of buzzwords that neoliberals would give you is that um, free markets of private enterprise coming up with innovative solutions are the most efficient way to deliver the things we all need. And anyway, they kind of reflect the true nature of human beings, which we know are a bit selfish. And besides, and this is a big one, you know, we did try that alternative, socialism, and really sorry, but it didn't work, so you've got to have this. It's kind of the stuff, and we can all look at it and say, well, it looks a bit shit to us, actually, because, you know, there's people suffering over there, there's people still not, you know, having enough to eat. Um, if mothers feel like they have to go to work, whereas before, you'd, you know, maybe you did or you didn't want to go, now you've got to go, it feels like. It doesn't feel right, but you're telling us that it's efficient, markets, we need to have these free markets, all this kind of stuff. And somehow, if you can't unpick that, you feel very disempowered. And there's so much nonsense in there, it's untrue. I mean, markets, for example. I mean, if you challenge a neoliberal around the word market, like I did recently, they'll say, you don't believe in free markets. You know, you're somehow anti-liberal, you're somehow anti-freedom. But markets are just places where people exchange goods and, and, and services. And of course we're into markets. We've, you know, Stroud, we're very proud. We've got the UK's best farmers market. Thank you very much. We love markets. Markets are great. If you don't have markets, you just had one taxi company in Totnes, you're going to get a poor service. So markets are good. Yeah, we're all up for markets. No problem. Free markets, you know, so they are basically saying, ah, but the kind of markets have got to be free markets. That means they can get away with what they want, really. That's what they mean when they talk about freedom. But ask them about intellectual property. You know, how, what's free about intellectual property? You create a drug and you say, I'm sorry, that's my drug. I know it solves AIDS, but, you know, and I know it was funded partly by the, um, you know, public education system, but it's our drug and you can't have it unless you pay a lot, there's a lot of money. Ask them about patents. Ask them about the enclosures when the lands that everybody had, they were thrown off and suddenly it belongs to somebody and you're not getting it back. You know, 69% of the land in the UK is owned by 0.3% of the population. You know, what's free about that? Um, Privatisation, you know, this myth that privatisation's better and you might think, oh, well, maybe the phones did get a bit cheaper. I, I don't know, but... Um, there's been a review of all the reviews looking at privatisation, and it's not the case. It does not improve things, privatisation. I'm sure you've had lots of experiences that would demonstrate that to you. It's not to say sometimes there's not some value in it, but uh, you could go about privatisation. You could actually create co-ops within the health service. It's not about not creating smaller scale things, but it's, it's not about profit making. That's what they really mean by privatisation, is allow us to make a profit from everything. Innovation, you know, of course you've got to have these ramp, you know, rampant free market capitalists innovating or we wouldn't all have these wonderful uh, you know, iPhones or whatever. There's loads of innovation goes off without capitalism. If you look at the open source movement, if you look at what academics will do on actually quite a small salary just because they're so obsessed with one particular bit of science or, or maths or whatever, Innovation does not require the profit motive. The third sector innovates. So let's bust that myth. And it's efficient. You know, what on earth is efficient about advertising, about persuading people to feel bad enough to want to buy something? What's efficient about espionage amongst companies to see what they're doing so we can, you know, uh, spy on them and, 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 get and, and have a strategy against them? What's efficient about... Um, not having a local company and having to have one come from outside. Um, what's, what's efficient about incompatible software? It drives me absolutely mad, and I'm sure it does you. And in, in economics, they talk about externalities. You know, one of the things that they, they like to do is to externalise some of the costs. And what that actually means is, OK, I've created this pollution, but you can clean it up. You know, that, that's, that's somehow, you know, efficient to, to, to externalise things. So some of the things that drive you mad in your life, like um, potholes in the road, 
they create economic growth because they're going to damage your car and you're going to go to the garage or you're going to find it difficult on your bike and you're going to create a bit of, a bit of economic activity. Or when you're phoning some call centre and going round and round in circles and, you, you know, that's an, it's externalised to your time, that's taking up your time. What's sufficient about that? Is that making you happy? It's good for the profit motive. Um, a classic one about the... Um, you know, the, the reason why the potatoes are on the slide, you know, when we are exporting as many potatoes to Germany as we're importing, you know, they're like waving to each other on the way. <laughs> What's efficient about that? It's obviously mad. Um, so it, efficiency, uh -uh, no thanks. And this idea that it gives you what you want. Um, as I said, we often are doing things out of busyness. Um, we're not, I, I often buy things and think that's really bad quality, but where was the alternative to that poor quality item? Um, and that we're selfish, you know, that, that, that it emerges, that this statement here, there's nothing we can do about it, it's just human nature, that we're selfish creatures. Well, actually, you know, if you look at biology, that's not the case. Of course, there's some selfishness in human nature, but cooperation seems to be, from all the studies, a much more human thing to do. And there's lots of feedback loops in, in, in societies. If you put us under certain circumstances, we'll behave in certain ways. You know, there's a real dynamism to what people do. And no more, um, no more clear than when you put us into an unequal society, which I'll talk about later. And then Tina, which is which, what Mrs. Thatcher said, there is no alternative. You're getting this one. Which is hilarious, actually, because when the banks get bailed out, that's a form of socialism. So the rich get socialism and the rest of us get neoliberal capitalism. But there is no alternative. Well, even within capitalism, there are different forms of capitalism. There's the Nordic capitalism, which has got very high taxation and a lot of public services and seems like, you know, generally a nice place to live. There's continental and Asian forms of capitalism. The neoliberal form is just a form. And, of course, there are other non-capitalist forms as well. People talk about economic democracy, a much more cooperative uh, form of economy. There's green economics, there's the Austrian school. They all get lumped together at the moment called, and, and are called heterodox economists because they're going against the orthodoxy, which is neoliberalism. Yeah, Mrs. Th <laughs> okay. Wondering whether I should have a witch because I, you know, pagan and feminist as well. But um, as a as a coal miner's daughter, she's a witch, you know, uh, in the wicked witch sense. But if it's this, there's this sense that the economy has emerged out of our nature. That's something that's kind of out there as well. But Mrs. Thatcher said, and it totally gives me this creeps, this, this statement, but economics are the method, the object is to change the heart and soul. She said that greed was good and that there was no such thing as society, and that's the direction that they've been moving us in. So since 1979, we've, in the UK, we've had a neoliberal economic system. And the, the, it's a very mathy thing, neoliberalism. It's it, neoclassical economics, it's also called... Um, we sometimes say that um, economists had physics envy, you know, it's taught, taught, called the dismal science, you know, they wanted to use maths to show um, and model the economy and make predictions and that kind of thing. And the basis of their modelling is, let's imagine one household that works in one company and buys its stuff from that company, so a very simple model. And then we scale up from that model and we can create all sorts of... of uh, solutions from that and, and make all sorts of statements. Uh, well, I used to model molecules. I used to model how proteins and, and, and sugars interact. Um, and within science, you know, you get emergent properties at different levels. So, you know, from atoms, you get the world of molecules. From molecules, organelles. Organelles, you get um, cells and then organisms and then, you know, uh, animals, higher organisms, societies. You get these w things that you wouldn't have imagined. You, very, very difficult to model from a simple s system. It's kind of, um, let's say, ambitious. <laughs> but it's okay to have a theory. The other thing they don't do in the models is look at what banks do and how they create money and the role of debt and the fact that things can go bankrupt. It's just not in the models. It's amazing. And it's a core feature of the economy. It's very central to the mess we're in. So you know, it's amazing that they, they don't seem to bother with that one. Um, there's a missing video, but never mind about that. Um, so, 
a real key thing is that the neoliberal models did not, and in particular could not, predict the economic crisis. And the video I was going to show you was Richard Feynman talking about science, saying, you know, you can have a theory, it doesn't matter how beautiful the theory it is, how, how many Nobel Prizes they've won for that theory, how gorgeous it looks, who said it. If it doesn't fit the data, it's just wrong. You know, forget it, scrap it, start again. And have, have we had some big soul-searching amongst neoliberal economists? Absolutely not, quite the opposite. Since the crash, they've just done what... Um, I don't know if I've got the quote up here or it's out there. We've just done exactly what um, one of the... Um, I think it was Greenspan. No, it was Milton Friedman who said, when there's a crisis, take it as an opportunity. Get out of your back pocket all the things that you wanted to have happen. You know, so austerity, that'll do. That's a good ex excuse. We've got a financial crisis. So they haven't done that soul-searching. They actually carried on, which is astonishing. And obviously, within neoliberalism, they're dim diminishing key issues like inequality and damage to the environment. And they're, but they're very lucrative um, for rich people and for big companies. And that's just fundamentally why it's emerged and why it's still here. You, so we should be binning this theory. And, and if you want uh, more on that, there's a really good book called Debunking Economics by Steve Keen. There's also YouTube clips. And lots of the things that I'm talking about today are um, on this uh, leaflet here. And there's a website, streetschooleconomicswordpress.com. And I've put all the cool stuff that I've found uh, on, on the internet. So Steve Keen. Steve Keen focuses on Hyman Minsky's work. And it, it's really about um, economies are dynamic. In neoliberalism, they like to look at a steady state economy. Well, you know, it's like the economies and more like the weather, you know, there's a constant flux. It doesn't get to a steady state. And really, I mean, a fundamental question shouldn't be what is economics, what are we studying? It would be, what do we want the economy to do? What is it for? What are our values? What are we trying to achieve with the kind of economy we have? That's a good question to ask. A lot of... Um, orthodox economists would say that's the wrong question to ask, as if you were just studying it like it's nature. Absolutely not. Policies will change the kind of economy you have. So you've got to be asking yourself fundamentally, what are we trying to achieve? And for me, and I think probably most people in this room would agree, why don't we maximise our happiness and minimise harm to each other and the planet? What if that was a goal? It, that, that feels like a good goal to me. Um, the current goal, and you'll hear it ad infinitum, it drives me mad, is economic growth. We've got to keep the economy growing. It's, you know, we've all got to keep moving, we've got to keep peddling. And that's measured through um, GDP. And there's something in economic growth that makes some sense. The pie can get bigger if you improve how you do things, if you develop new technologies, if you slightly change how something's done. So it's not entirely wrong that you can't grow, but obviously most of the growth that we're seeing comes from debt and comes from rape in the environment. It's not coming through these amazing technology changes. Um, and so instead of measuring GDP, we could measure something like the Happy Planet Index that the New Economics Foundation have come up. There are other ways of measuring the economy. But if we just say GDP is a key thing and we've got to keep measuring that, then we're going to keep, you know, doing the same thing. And whilst we've got the myths in our head about neoliberalism, do we actually know why, what they want and why? Do you know, do, have, have the public been told, well, we keep talking about economic growth and that's a major thing we want, but we also want these other things. Well, here are the goals of a neoliberal economy is absolutely set up to control inflation. Because if you've got financial wealth parked somewhere and you get inflation, then the value of that stored wealth is going to go down. So they absolutely want to control inflation. They don't seem to worry about peak oil enough uh, in that equation, but that's um, a, obviously a blind spot. Now, you know, inflation is related to the amount of money in, a, in an economy and how much people are paid. So. If you have more activity in an economy, you might want more money in that economy, which helps the activities to kind of flow, if you like. 
Um, and as long as the wages go up, inflation's no big deal. But they don't want inflation because they've got stored wealth. And um, there's a real thing about restoring insecurity and labour discipline. So if you found yourself like me saying, oh, I'm a bit bored of my job, oh, at least I've got a job, you know, congratulations, they've won. That's what they want you to think, insecure, because you're more likely to put up with lower conditions at work, worse, you know, worse um, policies, health and safety, whatever. Really against the sense of entitlements. They want us working. And at the minute, if you're watching what's happening around um, the welfare state, what's lined up next is the tax credits. And they've said, it's all very well with people that are basket weaving, I think the guy said. He might have been Ian Duncan Smith and claiming tax credits. We're going to have to deal with that. So I think a lot of us that are in transition, that are using that way of sustaining our lifestyle, we're going to, they're coming after us next, basically, so watch out. They talk about wanting to shrink government, but you'd be amazed that neoliberal governments spend the most money, actually. They, they, and then they go on about the debt that's been created because they take on wars. So they spend loads of money, actually. Um, but they really want government just to be there to protect business and private property. That's, that's what they want government to do. And they don't want any corporate taxation. So whenever they're sort of talking about tax justice and, you know, let's all get on Amazon's case, which I agree with absolutely, in truth, they want zero corporate tax rate. And they prefer taxes to be things like VAT, which went up to 20%, and we all just seem to take it. VAT is something that affects ordinary people. It's a, it's, um, a regressive tax, which means because ordinary people, um, the, m the more poor you are, the more of your income you spend on a day-to-day -day basis and you're going to be taxed on it. So when they take taxes away from the rich and corporations and put it on VAT, it's really a way of, of, of being regressive and, and putting taxation on, on poorer people. So it's about restoring the domination of private business and the wealthy. It emerged in the 1950s uh, when the welfare state was being built. And they were getting a bit crazy about this. You know, what's going off? The, the, these people are building the NHS. They want, they want to reverse that. They want to dom get the domination of private business. And it's really about fostering a sense of resignation. You know, the financial crisis, I've said, has been a perfect opportunity. Austerity is... Um, a, a way of really getting us to feel resigned. And there's a few ways in which they, you know, they, they play with the economy in terms of interest rates and deregulation and all the rest of it, but probably too much detail. So, uh, you know, how, how did they get here? How did, how did they manage to do it? Well, it really was... Um, there was an awful lot of corruption involved, actually, a lot of coercion, a lot of um, pressure. And... I don't know if many of you have read, um, who's read Shock Doctrine by Naomi Klein. It, it, a really good book for sort of explaining the tactics. And I mean, for example, the chapter on South Africa, as the South African people were fighting for liberation and to be able to vote, in the background they were saying, right, we know we're, we're going to lose this battle, so we'll just sew up the economy to make it work for us anyway. Um, so we'll come back to the corruption angle. So, so I, I kind of, for me, the flow is really, you know, we've based the economy on neoliberalism. It absolutely needs debt to fuel it. And debt leads to a depletion of the environment, and it leads to a distribution in wealth that's unequal. And when you get an unequal distribution in wealth, some people have got a lot of money and they can use that to buy power. And that um, basically leads to more corruption, more neoliberalism, and so it goes on. So there's an awful lot of talk about debt these days, but the focus is on government debt. And actually, when you look at how much government debt there is compared to GDP, it's not that bad, actually. I mean, we've taken on some debts that are toxic, and we should get rid of them. Some of the banking debts, they should just, we shouldn't have them. We should need to have a citizen's uh, debt audit. Um, the most, most of the debt is at the householder level, these mortgages that we've got, credit card debts, and debts of business, and debts in the finance sector are horrendous. Uh, that's where the debt problem is. So the, the reason why there's so much debt around is because money is debt. And I don't know who's seen the positive money agenda. Um, again, there's lots of links off street school economics. So 
this, if you haven't heard this, it's really hard to get your head around, but it's as bad as it sounds. Money is just created out of thin air by the banks whenever people want a loan. There's a little bit where they're supposed to have so much money stored, it's called fractional reserve banking. But anyway, once, once the money's created as a loan and it gets put into other banks and it circulates, 100, say, pounds of, of created um, loan becomes a thousand pounds because it sort of circulates but anyway you just look at the positive money video for that explanation so so 97 percent of the money that's in circulation and it's mostly you know it's not i'm not talking about notes and coins i'm talking about the the digits that are in our bank accounts is it's just, it is debt so you can't not be in debt if most money is debt um and basically debt is a tool to mitigate profit what i mean by that and mark said this that if you go back to that household and it's working in a factory, but the factory owner's taken a profit, how can the person possibly afford to buy the goods that are being produced because somehow you know, part of the profit's being creamed away? Well, what you can do is keep trying to expand into new markets, but eventually you run out of steam, so you have to give people debt. You get people into debt, and then you can carry on the consumerism. So you have to have debt as a way if you want to carry on having profit. And debt's very much linked to the depletion of the environment because in order to cover the debt that people have, the economy's got to be not only as big as that debt, but as big as the debt plus the interest that you pay on that debt. And of course that gets compounded because the interest gets added on and then next year you've got the debt plus that interest, etc. So by its very nature you have to have economic growth. There's a whole pile of really useful videos on YouTube by Chris Martinson um, called The Crash Course, which will take you through that on a slower way if you want to understand more about that. And I don't feel like everybody has to understand every little detail in economics, but you know, it's, it's up to you how, how much detail you want to go into. I just want people to know that there's an alternative. That's like my one thing that I want people to know, but there's a lot more behind it. And then companies, by the pressure of, of the economy have, have to get into debt to expand because otherwise some other aggressive company who's taken on debt to expand is going to come in and get their marketplace and it really pushes against local businesses you know that other companies are going to come in I mean obviously a, a hairdresser is different but you know other forms of companies um, it's, it's much harder to be a small farmer for example um, and they have to shrink their margins. And if you're a small company, you can't mess about with tax havens either. So, you know, there's a real pressure against small in this kind of economy. And that debt basis really affects the quality because people, you know, every single thing's got debt involved. Every single thing's then you've got to pay interest on it. You've got to keep pulling on the margins. So that means that you've got to shrink the quality. And, and actually, because you've got to travel, you've got to send your goods and services around the place, then you've got to have cheap transport, you've got to have cheap oil, which, as I'm sure you all know, is running out. And what's amazing about letting the banks is private enterprises create money. We've handed that over to them. Government used to create money, banks now do it. It's not only do they get to create money out of thin air, but they get to charge you interest on it. I mean, it's amazing, you know. And fundamentally, what debt is and what interest is, is your future labour. And your future labour is owed to somebody else who's wealthier. You know, somebody owns your debt as an asset and they're taking interest from you. And that's a transference of our energy to the wealthy. And that's what I mean about being farmed. You know, that's the kind of feeling. And it's real. I've got a few slides like this and I can't go through all the detail, but basically there are loads of solutions to debt. And I don't believe in winding people up with problems without saying what the solutions are. So there's um, a whole pile of solutions written on the leaflet there that we hand out. But, you know, some of them are at the policy level. Some of them are what communities can be doing and some of them are what individuals can be doing. And just to, I don't know, pick one, which I'd love everybody to know about, is the idea of the modern debt jubilee. So what are we going to do about all this debt if we want to transfer to a new economy? Well, obviously, we've got to re-regulate the banks and there's something called capital controls you have to put in place so that the money can't just fly overseas. And then, and I'm sure loads of people have had this thought, you have to give everybody some money. 
and they have to use it to write down their debts. I'm sure loads of people went, why are they giving all this money to the banks? Why don't they just give it to us? Well, yeah, it's a brilliant policy solution and Professor Steve Keen has been on there pushing for that solution. And exactly right, that's how we're going to deal with debt in the future. This Prez is online, so if you want more on the solutions. But what I've done, because I've not seen it anywhere else, is put together a, a manifesto for economic justice, taking together all these different um, solutions that are out there for different issues. It's probably quite a bit like the Green Party's manifesto, in truth. But um, it, it's not the same. OK, so um, I'll run through this bit quickly, because we know about depletion. We know that we're damaging the environment. Um, that we've got peak oil, so therefore the energy, you know, basically the energy required to extract energy sources, fossil fuels, is increasing. It's getting more expensive to take the stuff out of the ground, but there's also increasing demand. And when you put that next to decreasing supply, that is a basic rule in economics, you get price hikes, and we're seeing that. And back in 1972, there was a book called The Limits to Growth, came out of the Club of Rome think tank, and they said, you know, in several years' time, you're going to hit the limits to growth and we're going to be in trouble, and we're there. We, you know, we, we, we're, hello, we're arriving. Um, we're seeing exponential growth of many issues like water, usage, um, species extinction. It's depressing. And there are many economists that just don't see a limit to growth. And there's Reagan saying there's no such thing as limits to growth because there are no limits to the human capacity for intelligence, imagination and wonder which is beautiful, Ronald, thank you very much, and actually I agree on some level, but the reality is the growth is coming from rape in the environment and not, some of it is coming from human imagination, but certainly not enough. Climate change, I probably don't need to say anything about it, but it's clearly, it's, to me it's a clear sign of how insane our system is, that we're just marching off, and the rich people might be at the back of the queue, but they're in the queue to jump off the cliff with the rest of us, and I'm sure they've got grandchildren on the way as much as the rest of us have. Um, it's already costing the economy, so it's another pressure on the economy, as well as peak oil, as well as the debt crisis. And what's interesting is that neoliberal societies are the most unequal societies, which I'll show you in a moment. And in unequal societies, people are a lot less willing to focus on climate solutions. There's an absolute correlation between the two. So, interesting, you know, if, if we want to work together, we need a more equal society. Again, this, the kind of solutions side, um, which I think I, I probably just need to, to skip over, but... Um, there's plenty of ways in which we can use a tax system, for example, to make the polluter pay. There's lots of things we could do, have a law against ecocide, etc. New Economics Foundation have outlined how you would undertake a great transition to a different economy. The work's been done, yeah. We don't need to think, oh, nobody knows what to do. It's just that it doesn't make it into the mainstream. Inequality is huge. I think we're well aware of it and it's very costly in an unequal society you get more problems and we all have to sort out those problems and it absolutely feeds corruption because so when you've got money in your back pocket you start to believe that you have some right to that and you start to you know look after your vested interests it's, it's hands in the air again who's read the spirit level book it's a fantastic uh, piece of work uh, and, and basically when you map a graph of um, social problems against the amount of money in a society. There's no correlation. It doesn't matter how much money there is around. There's no correlation with social problems. But when you map, here's the, here's the index of social problems. It's called the Gini coefficient against income inequality. So that's comparing the bottom 20% to the top 20% uh, in, in terms of income. And you've got a high inequality at this end then you get high social problems, and that's a hell of a correlated graph. The USA is the most unequal society in the world, then Portugal, and we're number three in the UK. And when you have that, you have less trust, as I said, less, less desire to work on climate change, there's more teenage pregnancies, there's more obesity, there's more mental health problems, 
And it's not just at the kind of poor end. It affects everybody. There's something about inequality that just doesn't work for people. You know, it's this feeling of, you know, I've, I've, I've got to shore up my own position. Unfortunately, and it's the thing that we've really got to worry about and, and work on, when you're put into that position, people are more willing to kick the people that they consider to be underneath them. So, you know, the, the, the big pressure at the minute is to blame migrants or, or, or whatever, you know, and people are more willing to do that in an unequal society. So they kind of got us on that one. Um, I don't think they meant to do that, but make a society more unequal and we're more willing to f foster that divisiveness. We've, we've, so we've so got to, uh, to work against that. And there's this really strong... I mean, I think this is 1930s Germany propaganda at the moment. The, 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 the pressure to talk about the benefit scroungers and the fraudsters and these flipping layabouts that aren't working and being productive and they just want the rest of us to, to look after them. And, it, you know, it, it, it's this idea that they're the ones that we should be targeting. And also, you know, don't get on about the wealth creators, the wonderful people like Richard Branson, you know, good old Richard, Virgin. You know why he's called Virgin? Because it's all in the Virgin Islands, his company. He doesn't pay any tax. Only 3.4% of these wealthy folks are actually entrepreneurial, and we're supposed to worship them. Most of them are, are undertaking what's called economic rent-seeking, you know. They're just, they just make money for no good economic activity. And this graph here... This here is benefit fraud, and this is tax fraud, the official uh, tax fraud value. This is tax fraud according to the Tax Justice Network. This one wouldn't include um, things like uh, some of the tricks that Amazon and uh, Starbucks have got up. This one would, tax avoidance is in here. This is a tax gap. You know, where's the problem? <laughs> Uh, and this is one of my favourite quotes from the Tax Justice Network's John Christensen. Remember the golden rule, those with the gold make the rules. There's lots we can do about inequality, about limiting pay differentials, promoting cooperatives and employee-owned businesses. And we should get rid of interest. You know, we don't have to have interest. Many societies would not have supported interest and they supported debt jubilees. So, given all this extra money that people get to, to save up, and the, you know, within the um, economic crisis that we've been living on, there's been, there's been an increasing number of billionaires. The money that's been created this time has gone to the billionaires. Um, and they, how, how do they keep hold of that money? Uh, tax havens is a, a real core feature of a corrupt system. There's many other forms of corruption, but I just wanted to focus on that. They could also be called secrecy jurisdictions. They're places in the world that offer little or no tax, little or no regulation, which is crucial, <coughs> and secrecy is on offer. And they're basically a way of undermining democracy, because if you can afford to use them, if you don't like the rules in your own country, you just go over there and there's no rules. You know, and you, there's a whole pinstripe army, of mafia we call them, the pinstripe mafia of accountants and lawyers that will, that will make it work for you. And tax havens used to be seen as this kind of exotic sideshow. It's just this thing that's happening over there and a few rich people have got a bit of money over there. Never mind, don't move along, everybody. Well, half of world trade goes through them. And the amount of money offshore is up to 32 trillion. That's 20 trillion in, 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 an, in English money, sorry, UK money. Um, if you stack that, those dollar bills one on top of each other, they'll go to the moon and back four times. That's the amount of money offshore. It's absolutely incredible. And that's not including the wealth that people have got stored in, you know, Picasso paintings and um, yachts and whatever. That's just the, the financial wealth. Unbelievable. And because of all that secrecy and lack of regulation, they faci facilitate, obviously, the tax dodging, but also bribes, also market rigging, the financial crisis just could not have happened without the tax haven system because that's where the banks do all their dirty dealings. It's called the shadow economy. Drug and human trafficking goes through the tax havens. And it's what dictators and criminals and the mafia use to get on with their business. And often when we talk about um, you know, aid and development, third world countries and all that kind of language, people have got this sense of corruption. Oh, well, it's a chain, but they're really corrupt. And... Actually, you know, corruption has got a white face and it looks like an accountant. 
That's what corruption looks like in the world at present. There's a supply side to corruption, is what I mean. Um, much of uh, Gaddafi's money, for example, was in the city of London. And, and, and by the way, when people from overseas use the city of London, which is one of the biggest tax havens to put their money in, that gets invested in the property market in the UK, using some little financial shenanigans, and it puts all the prices up. And so, you know, the house that I bought for £330,000 sold for 70. Well, that inflation in house prices, there's not been an equivalent wage inflation. So now more of my future labour is owed to somebody. Um, somebody who's got their money in a tax haven is owning my mortgage as, a, as an investment. And very importantly, because, um, you know, John Christensen, who, who worked undercover in the tax haven industry, for a long time, you'll just, as a junior, you don't get to see much. When you get quite senior, the scales fall away. And then you see all the political donations. You see all the insider trading. And it's disgusting. And it's absolutely corrupt. Something like 50%, I think, of uh, part of political donations comes from the city of London. So we know we've got a captive state. There's a massive lobbying industry, 4,000 people, a £2 billion industry. And it's worth lobbying. You know, for, there's, there's an American study. For every dollar you spend on lobbying, you get $100 back. It's, like it's an investment. It's worth doing it. Banks get up to all sorts of corrupt things. Um, but no worries. They'll get a fine. It'll be something like 1% of their profits. Big deal. It's a cost of business. There's a new study from the Tax Justice Network. There's an e-book about the finance curse. And basically what that's saying is actually when you get an over-bloated financial sector, which we absolutely have in the UK, it will drain money and drain resources and drain intellect. And it, they talk about um, the... Um, well, I'm not going to say it properly, but it's, a, it's the way in which... The, London um, can give, pass all the risks on to the rest of us, as in we bail them out, um, but takes all the profit. But are you going to see that story in the mainstream? You'll see the exact opposite. The city of London is so beneficial to us all. God bless the city of London because it's the great you know, engine of our economy and let's all be grateful and let's stop bashing the bankers because they're sorry you know, for what they did. That's down to a capture of the media, a capture of think tanks and a capture of econ economic sorry, economists, you know, economists work for the city, etc. And they're the ones that get on the TV. There's an awful lot you can do about tax savings. You'll hear people talking about, well, oh, there's just loopholes and, you know, there's nothing we can do. There's a whole pile of things that have been worked out, won't go through them, but it's absolutely possible. Um, I mean, I, I have a, <coughs> a proposal around... Um, how we should handle this level of corruption, which is about organised civil disobedience. But as I said, I won't talk about that on camera, so maybe I'll come round to that at the end if people want to hear kind of where I'm at with that piece. So that's the overview. And as I say, all the details are there on the Street School Economics website. Um, so just to talk very briefly about the idea of street school economics is, OK, we kind of know all this stuff. Let's put it together in our own heads. Let's become economically literate enough ourselves that we feel empowered to talk about it. You don't have to know everything. No economist does. Don't worry about that. And if anybody asks me a question I can't ask, answer tonight, I'll just go and ask a friend of mine. You know, we don't have to um, be perfect in this subject. Nobody else is. But let's promote economic literacy and let's promote our own. And let's go out on the streets and talk to other people about economics. You can have cafe economics or you can have reading groups. The thing that I've been trying is uh, called a street school and we take this kind of stuff out. Um, and we're not trying to preach to anybody. We just have, and there was another one out there, we just have these signs. And the idea with the signs was, well, let's reflect the kinds of things that might be in people's heads already. <coughs> and people read these things and they go... Well, yeah, I did think that. Yeah, yeah, and they come up to you and you just say, what do you know about economics? What do you think about it? And I, I was absolutely surprised people want to talk about it. I really encourage everybody to, um, to, to think about doing something similar. The, the leaflet that um, was designed pro bono um, can be made Totnes 
appropriate if you want. She's happy to do that. Um, if you want to promote more of the transition type initiatives that are happening in Totnes. So some of the things you can do at a community level are mentioned in there and you could say, for example, Totnes is whatever. So the final message, I think, is don't leave economics to economists.